Senate papers. Uh, call the meeting to order. We have the motion moved by Councillor Morio, second by Councillor Delore. These all the agenda for the July 17th regular meeting of council be received. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. We have the motion moved by Councillor Memorial, seconded by Councillor Delore. Resolve the minutes of July 3rd, 2018. Regular meeting council be adopted as received. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Okay, the first item on your agenda, Council, we have a delegation of Captain Jones from the Manitoba Canadian Ranger Company. Uh, we received a letter from uh, the Rangers and see if there's any interest in Swan River and we thought we would invite you to have a mixed presentation to our Council. So welcome to our Council meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor McKenzie and your uh, Council. Um, my name is Captain Wade Jones. I'm the officer commanding the Canadian Rangers in Manitoba. And my aim, as I outlined in my letter to the Mayor a couple of months ago, was to provide enough information to the uh, Mayor and Council that they can make a decision that if they thought the community would be interested in forming a Canadian Ranger Patrol. So tonight I uh, will give you some additional information up and above the letter that I provided uh, so that you can make a conscious decision. So today's briefing is going to cover a brief history of the Canadian Rangers, the Canadian Ranger Patrol Groups in Canada, so we have an overview of how it works across the country the role and mission of the uh, Canadian Rangers. I'll talk about the 4th Canadian Ranger Patrol Group, which I am a part of, and the Manitoba Canadian Ranger Company. The Canadian Ranger pay, how they earn their pay, uh, their equipment usage reimbursement rates, and our concept of training. So today's Canadian Rangers were first known as the Pacific Coast Militia Rangers and they were started in 1942 as a direct result of a perceived threat to the west coast of Canada. The role of these Rangers were to provide uh, uh, coastal service and surveillance in British Columbia, uh, immediate local defense in an emergency uh, that, and uh, that depended on the deployment of regular force troops to relieve them. At the end of World War II and at the end of the hostilities, the role of the 15,000 PCMRs faded and they were disbanded. On May 23, 1947, the Canadian Rangers as we know them today were stood up and their primary role was to conduct coastal surveillance of the coastlines and sparsely settled areas of Canada. In the 1970s, there was a renewed interest in Canada sovereignty rekindled by the, and the Canadian Rangers were rekindled as a result of more patrols in Northern Canada. The Canadian Rangers have continued to grow in numbers of patrols. In uh, 1997, the following Canadian Ranger patrol groups were organized across the country and this is how the Canadian forces have us organized uh, across Canada. So you can see that there are, uh, we're called CRPGs, that's Canadian Ranger Patrol Groups. There are five of them in Canada. One CRPG is in the Northwest Territories, Yukon and Nunavut. Two CRPG is Quebec, three CRPG Ontario, four CRPG is the Western Provinces, which I am a part of, and five CRPG is Newfoundland and Labrador. There are no Rangers in PEI, Nova Scotia, or New Brunswick. And I've been asked a million times, and I've asked a million times why they just had never evolved in that part of the country. So presently there are about 5,000 Canadian Rangers across Canada in 183 different uh, communities. The Rangers speak 26 uh, different languages and dialects, and many of those are uh, Indigenous languages. So the role of the Canadian Rangers the role of the Canadian Rangers is to provide a military presence in those sparsely and isolated northern communities which cannot conveniently or economically be provided for by other components of the Canadian forces. And our mission, the mission of the Canadian Rangers 
is to provide lightly equipped, self-sufficient mobile forces in support of Canadian Armed Forces sovereignty and domestic operations tasks. So in reality, this is what we do. We conduct patrols, whether they be in, in the north of Canada, on the coasts, or even within central Canada. Report on unusual activities or sightings that may be strange aircraft, uh, strange ships, or unfamiliar personnel. Collect uh, data of uh, significance for the Canadian forces, and that uh, has to do with the infrastructure of communities that uh, we're in. Performing sovereignty or national security duties as assigned by the Canadian Army. Attest, or assisting in search and rescue efforts. Uh, the RCMP have the uh, role of ground search and rescue in Canada, and quite often in the northern and isolated communities, they have no other organized groups, and Canadian Rangers are the first people that they ask for assistance from. So we provide assistance to the local authorities, but we don't take the lead on GSAR. And assisting with natural disasters such as forest fires and floods, and we've done that all across Canada. Uh, just as lately uh, in the lower mainland this spring, Canadian Rangers were uh, deployed with Canadian forces. And in those instances, most of the time we are employed as guides and advisors because we have the uh, knowledge of the local area. So the Canadian Rangers have a motto and it speaks for itself, it's uh, vigilance, and it means the watchers. So we are watching those sparsely uh, inhabited areas and isolated areas of Canada. So the 4th Canadian Ranger Patrol Group, which I'm a part of, are the four western provinces. And our headquarters is in Victoria. We have 13 staff out there, and it's a lieutenant colonel that commands me from Victoria. We have a British Columbia uh, company. It's also headquartered in BC. They have 24 patrols in the province and 587 Canadian Rangers. Alberta, Saskatchewan is a combined company, and their headquarters is in Edmonton, and they have 10 patrols, 249 Canadian Rangers. And Manitoba Company, we're in Winnipeg, have nine patrols in the province, and 212 Canadian Rangers. And we also have a Junior Ranger Company. Uh, those are uh, youth from 12 to 18 years of age and uh, they are spread out through all four western provinces and they're commanded from Victoria and there are 30 patrols with 700 youth. So we have, uh, we have a total of 1,799 uh, personnel in the uh, 4th Canadian Ranger Patrol Group. So the majority of them, we only have uh, 54 full-time staff and the rest are part-time. So uh, 1,700 and 45, I guess it works out around, our uh, part-time Class A work 12 days per year. So the Manitoba Canadian Ranger Company, that's what I command in Manitoba. We have uh, had patrols in Manitoba since 2001, and that's as a direct result of what was called CanRan 2000. It was a review of the Canadian Rangers in Canada by the Chief of Defence Staff and it came with a recommendation of expanding into the, all the Prairie provinces in 2001. And that's when I started working actually with the Canadian Rangers. Currently there are nine Canadian Ranger patrols within the province. And you can see we have them in uh, La Crochet, we have 30 Rangers. Tadouli Lake, we have 14 Rangers. Churchill, 26 Rangers. Uh, Gillum, 37. Shimadawa, 16. Lynn Lake 25, uh, Snow Lake 26, and Grand Rapids 15, and St. Teresa's Point we have 21 for a total of 212. Now not all those patrols have been around since 2001. The majority of them were open between 2001 and 2003, and a couple were added later on. So 
So the real value of a Canadian Ranger is someone that uh, who knows the local area, he knows uh, the industries, weather patterns, and travel conditions, and can uh, provide advice to the Canadian forces. They can act as a guide. They get in and around their community. Uh, they can report unusual incidents. They know the habits of the local area, and they can identify uh, peculiarities to the Canadian forces. And that would be through my headquarters, they do that. And we, as a rough uh, guide, we say that uh, Canadian Rangers in the community are responsible for an area that covers about 110 uh, kilometers around their community, because that's the normal travel area of a trapper or a fisherman or people who just travel around. So it's about 110 kilometers. So desired, desired civilians to be employed as Canadian Rangers, outdoorsmen, farmers, guides, trappers, camp operators, commercial fishermen, hunters or loggers, pilots, either commercial or bush pilots, communication specialists in radio or telephone, or communications technician or repairman, uh, professionals such as teachers, nurses, retired military, RCMP, doctors, lawyers, uh, anybody like that, and tradesmen, uh, heavy equipment operators, uh, hydro workers, and things like that. And the reason why that we uh, like to have a, a good mixture of Canadian Rangers across a patrol strength is because we consider Canadian Rangers to be um, trained upon enrollment because of the geographical location and their skill set that they have uh, when they come to the uh, Canadian Rangers. All we do is augment some of their training with some military jargon and some uh, military things such as drill, uh, marksmanship that's shooting, uh, first aid, CPR, uh, communications, and things like that. So we add to their skills that they have already. So to join the Canadian Rangers, they must be a Canadian citizen, not be a member of the Canadian Forces in any other way, be between the ages of 18 and 65. Uh, special circumstances, we can enroll people over the age of 65 uh, if they have uh, something genuine and special that they can offer to the patrol or community. And there is no retirement age once you've joined. All I have to do is uh, reinstate why I need to keep you after age 65. So the oldest Canadian Ranger that is in Canada right now is well into his 80s, and the oldest one in Manitoba is 78. So as long as they can still um, uh, contribute to the patrol, then we'll keep them. You must not have been convicted of a serious crime for which a pardon hasn't been granted upon your application for enrollment. And uh, possess or produce a social insurance card, possess and produce a birth certificate, and be knowledgeable of the training surrounding your community, and you must live in the community, or in close proximity to, to the uh, community itself. And you must be healthy enough to carry out the uh, duties or the tasks of a community region. So what's a patrol? It's a strength of 32 and 2. So 32 are Canadian Rangers plus 2 if we start a Junior Ranger patrol because we have two people that look after the kids. So you can see how it's organized. We have a boss, a guy that helps them out, and then uh, several bosses down at the bottom and a bunch of workers. Okay, it's, it's a standard organization that we have in the Army and we apply it to the Canadian Rangers for control and, and uh, command and control. So, Canadian Ranger pay. So we work, our, our days are broken down into more than six hours or less than six hours. More than six hours, you get the first number, so the patrol commander, that's the boss of the patrol, he gets $175.49. If it's only a half a day, so an, an evening's training, he gets $87.45. And uh, all the positions are basically the same, okay, with the lowest pay being the ranger or a private, okay, is 133.48 uh, a day. Each one of these salaries are uh, incremental for the time of service that they have. 
So the longer they serve in that position, the more money they make. So a fourth incentive patrol commander will make just over $188 a day. And that is the same pay that any other reserve force member in the Canadian Forces makes. It's, it's not a, a special pay or any of that. And obviously this is, you pay taxes and EI and, and all that good stuff. It's just like any other job. Uh, this is the uniform that the Canadian Ranger Condition along with uh, some other equipment for the patrol as a whole. So they're easily identifiable when they are formed with any other member of the Canadian Forces. We're the only ones that wear red. And this actually is a guy from, uh, from Snow Lake, Ron Scott. So our concept of training. Canadian Rangers are considered trained upon enrollment and the CF provides a supplemental training. And the supplemental training is done in two ways. Uh, we can do it in the community over uh, a couple of week period, over a couple of years, or uh, they can volunteer to go to Victoria and they can participate in seven days training and get all the supplemental training at one time. So the basic training for a Canadian Ranger is called the Canadian Ranger Basic Military Indoctrination. It's based on seven days. Uh, we do patrol exercises, that's where we come and visit the community. We do some activities in the community and then we have a tendency to go away for a couple of days to practice those skills. They usually happen uh, twice a year. Try to do one in the summer and one in the winter, but it, it doesn't always work out that way. We have a Canadian Ranger Leadership Training, uh, which again can be held here centrally, or centrally in the province, or centrally in uh, Force CRPG, and we usually do it in Victoria. And it teaches an individual who has never had any exposure to leadership skills, uh, some skills on a talk, getting up in front of people and speaking, how to teach a little bit, how to uh, give orders, how to give guidance, and things like that. Uh, we have a Canadian Armed Forces shooting competition that's in Ottawa every year and we have Canadian Rangers that participate in that uh, nationally and the, the top Canadian Ranger across the country was from Gillen, Manitoba this year. So we're pretty active in that. And we do two collective training sessions annually for two or more patrols and we could do them anywhere within the province and what we do is we uh, invite people from from the other patrols to a place like, say, Lynn Lake, and we'll go to a remote location, uh, maybe fly to it, and uh, practice some of our skills there. And we try to do one of those in the summer and one of those in the winter. So like I said, we do uh, drill, marksmanship, navigation, search and rescue, and most of our search and rescue is uh, taught uh, by the Manitoba Emergency Services College, the Office of the Fire Commissioner. We have had a long-standing relationship with them, and they actually bring instructors into our communities and, and uh, teach the courses, as well as we have some uh, courses or qualified instructors as well. First aid and CPR. And we teach survival. Uh, the Canadian Rangers teach survival to other soldiers in their, in their regular or reserve force. So soldiers from Edmonton may come to Lynn Lake. We run a, a, a basically a three-day survival course for them and it's taught by the Canadian Rangers. And we do that all across uh, Western Canada. So they do, they build lean tubes and, and all that good stuff. So the Canadian Rangers make a point of traveling their area of responsibility surrounding their communities. So it's regardless of its long, a long uh, distance, short distances, regardless of the weather, the time of the year, night or day, okay, we uh, expect that the Canadian Rangers can get out and uh, travel around their AO. And the reason for that is because 
if the Canadian Army calls upon us to uh, provide support for domestic uh, operations, say there was a, a forest fire threatening the community, or there was a flood, or some, or an, an airplane crash, okay, uh, we ask the Canadian Ranger to be prepared any time to provide that support to the local authorities or to the armed forces if we're asked to do so. So, uh, I just going to talk a little bit about infrastructure. Uh, the Canadian Rangers have no infrastructure on the community, zero. So we commit to the community and we will rent a, a, a uh, classroom for the time that we're here. Um, so it could be a classroom in the local Elks Hall or the Boy Scout Hall or the Girl Guides or Scout Hall or the local school. So we pay to use that uh, facility. And the only uh, thing that we do provide to the community that stays here is a sea container and that's to secure their equipment in and that's usually arranged with the mayor or banning council uh, a location to put that and then the patrol commander is responsible for looking after it. Uh, it costs Canadian Rangers no money to participate. We actually pay them. We pay them pretty good as you're going to see in a, in a few minutes. Um, so all they have to have is some equipment, their own personal equipment. Snowmobiles or uh, LOSV is a snowmobile, that's military jargon. ATVs you're familiar with. Common ticks or trailers or toboggans that they haul behind. Uh, trucks, uh, uh, two different payments for trucks. Canoes, boats, road boats, uh, power boats, 16, 18, and each size of boat we have a different amount that we pay per day. And if it's horses, we pay for horses. We have a set rate for that. We pay for all fuel, all food, any oils, lubricants. Uh, if there's any damage to a uh, piece of personal equipment or clothing, then uh, we have a process by which we assess it and reimburse either have it repaired or replaced. So if a Canadian Ranger goes out on exercise for five days and he has a snowmobile and a toboggan, he's going to get $1,000 for his snowmobile and he's going to get uh, $500 for his uh, toboggan, plus we're going to pay for all of his fuel, all of his food, provide tents, stoves, and all that good stuff. So it costs him nothing. Unless he likes extra strong coffee, then he has to bring his own kind of thing. So after seeing those pictures, you're all saying, well, why, why has he come to, to Swan River? When I look at my, my map and my ability to react to a request for assistance from the local authorities, I have a huge gap from Snow Lake all the way down the western side of the province. So when I look at it and I look at the communities, the Paw is too big, Dolphin is too far south, and Swan River was the perfect location. And that's, that's the reason why I'm here. I do have other locations uh, that I consider to be gaps in the province, in the center of the province, and, and those are uh, communities that I'll be visiting over the next little while. So Canadian Rangers operate in extreme climatic and geographical conditions. They uh, patrol our mountains, forests, and coastlines and are equally at home on rivers, lakes, or on the tundra. Canadian Rangers' fundamental responsibility is to provide a military presence in the context of protecting Canada's sovereignty. <coughs> they also contribute to the activities of the Canadian Armed Forces by providing expertise regarding the uh, area in the proximity to their community. That concludes my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Councillor Jacobson. Uh, by the sounds of things, no doubt that the uh, Canadian Rangers offers a, a huge value to rural Canada. And uh, I thank you for your presentation. Um, just curiosity to say, um, are you going to also make this presentation at any, any of our other rural municipalities in the Swan Valley? Because it would be also very valuable for them to hear that as well. 
So, uh, in short, no, unless I'm invited to. So, uh, the next, my next goal would be is to give a presentation to the community at large, say in the arena or something like that, and then from there I would, if if the mayor agrees that I can come back, then I would, I would gauge by the interest there if we have enough people that would warrant starting a patrol. A community this size, I would think that we probably could get 32 people, or 42 people, or 52 people. And uh, if there are other communities within the real municipality that want me to come in and give a, a briefing, I can do that. But my aim is to provide uh, the information here so that uh, I can open a patrol here in Swan River. And you started answering my question. I was saying this. How, how you, would we move forward with this? What would be the next step? Right, after, after tonight's presentation and questions, uh, if yourself and the council think that it's a good idea for me to come back and give it, give a community briefing, then I'll come back and give it. It's a little bit different briefing. Uh, I can come back at any time and give that. It's, it's about 45 minutes long with answers and questions. Then I gauge uh, how many people are interested by basically a show of hands and then I go back to my boss and say yes Swan River wants it they have the capacity to do it and then he goes to his boss and he goes to his boss and it actually ends up in Ottawa and then we get an answer back and says yes open the patrol then we will come back take applications uh, do all the background checks and all that good stuff and it can be a fast process or it can be a slow process because we're dealing with our chain of command to Ottawa. So it could happen within two or three months or it could be four or five months. But I think with the, the government's goal of expanding the Canadian Rangers across Canada, I think that they're more likely to uh, act with haste with it because the government wants to increase our sizes from 5,000 to 7,000. Any other questions? I'm too old. Me too. <laughs> Me too. If not, I think we could thank you for your presentation. In my opinion, I'm not sure what the council thinks. I think it would be a useful uh, program for this area. We have a large area north of here with lots of lakes and rivers and streams. And there's lots of hunting and trapping and fishing and snowmobiling. It possibly would be useful. Sir, absolutely. Sure. Um, Where's the picture? Sorry. Where's the picture? Where is this picture? This is in Wainwright, Alberta. This was the most Canadian Rangers ever gathered together. That was in 2000, November of 2005. And it was in preparation for our uh, regular force soldiers to deploy to Afghanistan. And the Canadian Rangers acted as, I guess for, we acted as Afghanis. So we created circumstances like that to help train the soldiers to ready them for their deployment. So there was about 150 Canadian Rangers together at one time. That's probably one of the most that we've had together in any single location. So I think I can speak for council. Uh, he can see heads nodding and we're willing to try and move forward with the next step. So we... Okay. Um, we just have to uh, an agree on a, on a date. and. Uh, we can do that through Julie. Yeah, through Julie. Yeah, and uh, I can come up with a decent I, I think it's important when, when we do have the next step is to make sure a lot of our outdoors groups, uh, I don't forget the name of the Swan Valley Outdoors. Swan Valley Outdoors, the Trappers Association, make sure they're all come because it's just putting that in the paper and going directly, we're probably not going to get a good turnout. But if you if you bring people who have a, have a keen interest in this kind of activity, You'll probably get a better turn. And I have posters okay. that I can provide. Snow. And one thing I did I neglected to say is that we are not in competition with any other local organization. So if there's a volunteer fire department, you know, that does things, or if there's a uh, search and rescue Manitoba already established here, which I believe there is, or, you know, local gun clubs and things like that, we are not in competition at all with that. We want to share best practices and ideas and serve the community, and obviously the armed forces as well. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. I'll just show you this. Okay, we'll go to item 4.2 on our agenda. We have the public hearing on uh, 
variation. I call the hearing to order on variation application 2, 2018. The purpose of the hearing is to hear representation for or against the following variation application to allow the development of a C store and gas bar on a lot size 9,100 square feet, to allow a side yard setback of six feet, to allow the proposed development on a lot with a 70 foot frontage, to allow the proposed development to have 1,620 foot square, square foot C store on the property located at 703 Main Street. The requirements of section 169 of the Planning Act have been adhered to. Request any persons making representation to the hearing state their name and their civic address. Please. Do you want me to do the presentation or are you asking everybody first? What's the order? My name is Louise Watkins and we are owners. Uh, my husband Neil is not here today, but I'm representing both of us. We are owners at 705 Main Street, so the adjacent neighbor to uh, the applicant of the variance. Um, I kind of set this up in the order of the proposal list, so I'll kind of give my questions and comments in that order. And I do have questions, so feel free to interrupt me if you want to talk. Okay, for the development of a C-store and gas bar on a lot size 9,100 square feet, uh, in my view the lot is too small and restrictive to contain the type of vehicle traffic and turnarounds that would be involved in a gas station environment. Planning criteria recommend a minimum of 12,000 square feet and the site size is 9,100 square feet. So I'm not sure if uh, the 12,000 square foot recommendation includes the C store, but that would be 75% of the recommended space. So they're undersized by a good 25%. Uh, in my capacity, in my other job, I am a professional landscape architect, so I'm quite familiar with traffic patterns and landscape requirements, and uh, vehicle traffic is going to be a problem. Toxicity of exhaust fumes and potential for spillage in a busy downtown location is of environmental concern. Uh, it's my understanding there's an exhaust vent pipe that will be required for underground tanks, and it could possibly compromise our ability to have fresh air for our building, which is a big issue. We don't want to be slowly poisoned or have our building's fresh air supply being exposed to bring exhaust fumes into our business. Uh, if I'm reading this correctly, this is considered an accessory structure in Part 8.12b of the Town Bylaw documents. And I'm asking if, if, if it is, does it require to be a six foot distance to any main building or structure, this vent pipe? So that's a question that I have of, I guess, the, the contractor and, and of the development. So. Vent, vent pipe location. We've already moved our fresh air that was on the west side of the building uh, and it was going to go at the back so that we're not in conflict because they are allowed to build anywhere along our building. So our fresh air has to come at the back. But if we're at the back and they're at the back, 30 feet in the air and two feet higher than our building, which is the requirement, then our fresh air and the vent fumes are in direct conflict and we're limited to where we can actually put a fresh air vent. So that, that's an issue. We would like that vent pipe as far away from our building as possible. Uh, a parking curb access entrances to the proposed site. I have seen a, I'll, I'll call it a sketch. It's a plan in progress. I don't know if it's a final sketch and indications were to me through Town of Swan River uh, people like Ron indicated that uh, the parking or access may become a sloped curb which changes parking in the area and then it changes the requirements and which bylaws you follow. So if you're parking at a curb recommended setback for an intersection 
using Manitoba Public Insurance Driver's Handbook, page 88, which would be based on the Highway Traffic Act, says it's illegal to park within nine meters, which is 29 and a half feet of a stop sign or other traffic sign or signal posted at an intersection. So to me, that's a traffic light. So uh, that's an issue. There's other bylaws that say you need to be nine meters from the corner. So I'm wanting to know what is the actual requirement at that intersection. Uh, I looked up stopping distances because it's a very busy corner and locating the access point to that uh, area if it is a gas station. The stopping distance required including reaction time ranges, I have four different sources, from 75.5 feet to 115 feet. So if you're driving through at 50 kilometers an hour thinking you have a green light and somebody comes out of that gas bar and wanting to turn left or right and darting, you need 115 feet to react and stop. The lot is only 130 feet. So even if you have a one second reaction time, um, there's potential for a severe accident to occur. In the absence of clearly defined pedestrian walkways, the direction of traffic becomes hazardous. It's a safety concern for vehicle and pedestrian traffic mingling on a small site. The intent is for people to get out of their car and go in the convenience store so you aren't encouraging just drive through stay in the vehicle traffic. You're encouraging people to get out of their vehicle. Refueling with a semi truck. Most trailers are two and a half meters wide and completely hide objects behind them. So the entire back lane traffic will be blocked during re refueling. Uh, bylaw states you cannot block a back lane for longer than 15 minutes, but I don't know how long refueling takes. Uh, there will be a loss of a minimum of three parking spaces on 6th Avenue if there's curb access uh, created there. And that will reduce uh, the, the Valley Hotel at a minimum of seven behind as well. So it's a total of 10 parking spaces in that area. That would impact us, the Bowling Alley, Red Line Chrysler, and Club South. Uh, the parking group table 8.2 of the bylaws also requires one space per employee. So where will employee parking be located? And how much parking is required on this lot? Because that impacts us and our patrons parking around that corner and in the back lane. The L-shaped pocket of space encourages uh, dark areas for loitering. Even if they're well lit, they are a corner against our building and their building. And we live through the Valley Hotel and we know what kind of urban traffic can occur in a downtown situation, regardless of what town, city you live in. You know, there's social issues that happen and any pocket that you're gonna encourage or that's safe for people to sit on the ground or wait around or hang out uh, as a potential for unwanted behavior. Vehicle traffic that's now coming adjacent to our building is going to create noise pollution and I don't think it's a compatible use. There's going to be idling traffic and constant exhaust fumes. Snow removal is an issue. The site is so small, where are you going to put the snow? <coughs> where can you drive with snow removal equipment? How are you going to access the dumpster with a big truck? The minimum loading space required by Table 8.4 in the Town of Swan River bylaws is 33 foot length, but the minimum 12 foot width. Um, We've had tire marks on our building and chunked off corners just from the valley unloading beer and food in the back. And that's somebody who's a trained driver, not just a random person getting gas and zooming out. Entrance and exits required by the provision of vehicular entrances and exits to this site according to bylaw 8.1.7 GI indicate a minimum width of an entrance be 15 feet and a maximum combined width of entrance and exit to be 35 feet. So if the intention is to curb the whole area, then that goes beyond 35 feet or are you gonna to stick to the 35 feet? I guess that's what I'm asking. 
And if you do, then the next bylaw to govern the decision would be 8.1.72 to provide a barrier on or near all street sight lines to prevent vehicles from entering or leaving the site other than by way of entrances and exits. So without an enforcement of barriers or a curb or landscaping, people would be able to drive from the back lane if it's all open behind our building. I, I hope you're familiar with the site, but cut right across to the front corner and angle towards the light uh, if that would all be pavement. So there's people trying to follow roadways and potential for people not following roadways and pedestrian traffic. So. We see that there's conflicts. Environmental issues for spillage and emergency measures for above ground and below ground compromises the safety and integrity of our building if we would have to shut down because of a hazard on the adjacent property. Um, it's primarily pavement, going to be a pavement on the site, so where's the water drainage going to go? Uh, even the addition of the, the gravel for their ceremony, we now have water in our basement again, uh, which we never used to have. Uh, is the water drainage from the pavement going into the fresh, fresh water initiative storm sewers that are all painted with blue paint around the town? Or is it going to be diverted into a special collection for contamination filtering before it goes to a storm sewer? Uh, if the proposal does go through, we would ask for a permanent baller to concrete barrier to protect our building and the patrons for a six foot height of non-combustible material. Um, the intent of zero building, meaning you're allowed to build right beside, is I think meant for built buildings, not for vehicle traffic. Because right now you're gonna have, every vehicle driving into a gas pump is gonna be aimed at our building or every vehicle going into the C store will be aimed at our building. And I mean, Cook and Cooks has had two uh, drive throughs a vehicle into buildings and and that's on a well-marked intersection so there's potential there and I think it's a realistic uh, <coughs> request to ask for permanent vehicle proof fencing or bollards to be installed okay the next point for the side yard setback of six feet if the side yard setback of six feet is only for the purpose of a retail sign, we have no objective, uh, objection if it does not impede the visibility or functionality of the traffic light. Um, if through the design process, the six foot setback is for other items than signage, such as parking or other uses, then perhaps it would require further review. Um, Many guidelines recommend increased beautification and landscaping to make the side yard look more appealing, but I guess that's up to the owner. Okay, next item, proposed development on a lot with a 70 foot frontage. The guidelines recommend a minimum of 300 feet foot front frontage for a petroleum filling station. And the proposed frontage is one quarter the recommended size which is a huge discrepancy between recommendations and proposed dimensions. The site is too small to have both business ventures, either one or the other. Uh, even the fast gas that's advertised for sale has 150 foot frontage with two clear accesses and a lot of driving around the pump. You would never fit that kind of service bay on that site. Uh, the next item, proposed development of a 620 square foot C store. A convenience store that's open for hours that extend past traditional business hours will attract loitering traffic. And with the back side of the building to Main Street, all the pedestrian traffic <coughs> entries, the building will be from the south portion. So there's a pocket of unsupervised space with little visibility, no windows on Main Street will reduce visibility and quite literally block all pedestrian level traffic and appear as though you're at the back, back side of a building in a prime downtown Swan River location. The much traffic will funnel through the back lane and it was never intended to be a main service area for businesses but a, rather an access to businesses and staff parking. If the C-Store were reoriented to be adjacent the existing structure on 
against our building, whether it be zero clearance or four foot gap for fire code reasons, uh, there would be less likelihood for some wasted space and more opportunities for windows and a better aesthetics for street frontage and define the property line along Main Street with some attractive landscaping and uh, define the front edge. Obviously, a development permit application would have been submitted with plans and more detailed information with distances and property lines, but I, I don't have that, so I'm, I guess I'm asking some questions because I'm unfamiliar with the det details of the site. In closing, <clears throat> we've been in business at this location for 30 years. Uh, Neil has, I've been here 25. We've lived through the years of the Valley Hotel and its various owners. We're looking forward to new neighbors and developing the site with enthusiasm and ideas. It's our intent to see their business thrive and serve the public. We want development there. We're encouraging development, however, we do have many concerns with the current proposal and would recommend that this entire idea be developed on a more suitable site, an alternate site that provides better vehicle circulation, better public visibility, less safety hazards, with any development, regardless of type or owner, we would like to reduce all pockets of open space that could potentially encourage loitering. Loitering and create spaces and places that are not highly visible give rise to negative social activities. Considering our former neighbor was a hotel establishment in the past, we've experienced issues, urban issues such as finding needles, garbage or alcohol bottles on our doorstep, domestic disputes, smoking of weed in the back alley, condoms, public urination, vandalism, broken windows on our vehicle, to mention a few. Most people are respectful of our property and we are hopeful with new owners that loitering will be available. Sorry, but it's Just been a minute if you wish. It's been a, a lot of years with some pretty difficult neighbors. Access to the site is a huge safety hazard to vehicles and pedestrians. Chaotic traffic patterns without boundaries, limit parking, and it's a safety issue for the back lane, side yard, traffic light, and any vehicle crossing Main Street on 6th. Traveling adjacent our building is a hazard, and if this project does progress, we will once again require the six foot non-combustible barrier to protect our building. This in itself restricts us from maintaining our building face but to us it's a small cost for our patients. We do presently take wheelchair patients through our back door as it's a level entry compared to the front door and we would like to maintain our full access to our patients who are less able. The environmental risks I've also mentioned with the petroleum filling station, although it is commercial zone and an acceptable project, uh, St. Columbus Church is within the 500 recommended buffer area for large gathering spaces, so that's also a conflict, which would to me be another variance that has to be approved, uh, unless that's up to the council's discretion. We question the need for a gas bar and convenience store when the town of Swan River has abundance of similar services, such as co-op gas bar, quick stop, fast gas, extra boots, Conrad. Extra Foods, Gas Bar, Conrad's, Windsor's, Esso, to name a few. Along with grocery stores or business to handle food products such as Co-op Marketplace, Extra Foods, Giant Tiger, Red Apple, that are open Sundays and have extended hours into the evenings. This isn't a unique business and will put pressure on other existing business models. The owner of 703 Main Street indicated they had done research into viable options and perhaps they would have a better fit for this site. Our optional suggestions for development on this site could be a business building with professionals and lawyers that serve their uh, needs with main, on the main floor with apartments on the second level, along with smaller day rooms for overnight stays for medical trips, a technology development and training center, <coughs> a hotel with accommodations, no alcohol and bed and breakfast facilities, a stucco business or bricklayer trades training vocational center to name a few that would also comply with the commercial use zoning of the town of Swan River. We do have existing site conditions that require consideration that I, I have let known but I will let you know that we have a partial basement on the southwest portion of our building 
All drainage needs to slope away from the basement. We had incident where it was poor grading after the demolition of the brick and water flooded our basement and this is flood number two. Along with the operable windows on the west side of our building, the fresh air source to our building was on the west side, which we sealed up, waiting for the intended repurposing of this lot. Uh, the vents, I explained, are an issue and require consideration, as we don't want to be poisoned on a daily basis, and we don't think that's acceptable either. It's a health hazard to a business that promotes health, healthy living. The proposed placement of the underground fuel tanks are adjacent to our existing geothermal underground loop system. We have six well loops, they're vertical wells on our lot, and we require access to those loops if they need repairs. And so our parking service surface is gravel. <clears throat> the intended use of a convenience store will reduce our property resale value in connotation with loitering traffic, especially in an urban district. Reduce parking, Patients are scared to park on the street near a C-store. The reduced potential for someone renting upstairs in our building for living accommodations all have potential economic impacts on our business and future tenants. And finally, there's still one outstanding issue before even any of this can go through. And I mean, it almost seems like the front page that, they've, that they're proceeding without even approval. Um, they have not finished removing the foundation remnants on our adjoining wall. I have submitted a letter to the town, which I have a copy for uh, Chief Nelson, and the foundation remnants need to be removed. An inspection of the foundation, once they remove a portion <coughs> of it, is required to see if they've incurred cracks in our foundation, because there are cracks in theirs where they were pounding to remove it. Uh, I can show you a photo if you haven't seen it, but it's a portion of concrete about three feet high, about 15 inches wide, extends the 30 foot length, and we have put a metal flashing to prevent water from going between the two foundations as a temporary solution. The cracks are on the side so water and moisture can get in and behind, and we don't want any failure of our foundation. So once a new development is put four feet away, if that foundation is not removed and we have a problem. Now we're digging the cost of their foundation in a four foot tiny space to try and fix ours and that absolutely unacceptable. That foundation needs to come out. Uh, according to section 7.8 of the building removal of the bylaws, we're well within our scope to make this request. And the reason for submitting the formal request to remove the foundation is because some of you may know that when the brick was exposed, it was left in an unsafe situation during the months of June and October of 2016. The Tom Swan River intervened to formally ask the owner to remove the brick in a timely manner. I'm not sure if it was officially called the order to remedy, but the Town of Swan River proceeded to remove the bricks to make the area safe and the time frame of October 2016 um, was when that portion was complete. So we've been advised that there is an agreement between the Town of Swan River in order to comply with national building codes as well as an agreement or commitment to uphold continuing to remove those foundation remnants but we would like confirmation from the town to see if this in fact is in place. Is there a legal document is there an intent to remove this foundation that remains that they didn't take out right away? Um, we really don't want the whole foundation removed because it could compromise our building, but if it's brought down to ground level, reconcreted to slope away, capped, like we're fine with the compromise situation as long as we can inspect our foundation. And I think that's quite reasonable to ask for that. Also want to know if an environmental impact assessment has been done for this site. Uh, we did note that some of the fill going into this site had, I saw it, green vegetation and topsoil in there and I'm hoping that that's coming out and that proper fill can be compacted and, and put in the hole. I had no word from SAP or the town 
about the foundation since <coughs> October 2016, and we were in contact with their lawyer between 2016 and 2017 asking for a zero feet easement. Our property is approximately a half an inch to an inch the back of the building on their property, but the front is not. And the only reason it is is because Neil added a final siding and insulation to the existing stucco. So we're asking for an easement for the half inch to put on your land title before it was declared um, federal land status, I guess. And they wouldn't give it to us. So they said it complicated the issue and they wouldn't grant us. So now if we try and even sell our property at some point, we have no easement, because Neil had one written up years ago and the lawyer didn't file it with land titles. So right now we're at the mercy of the council to uphold the rules and bylaws that are set out, the rules and bylaws that are uh, in conflict with this development, the rules and bylaws and information we've been provided to at least secure our building and be able to move forward. I mean, two years since the renovation, I think a year before they decided when to move it, it's a long time to be dealing with these issues. Um, I do thank you for taking a, a nice summer day out to come in here, and I, I feel like it's whining and complaining, but if we don't voice our concerns, then you don't know some of the further details regarding the project and said we're pro-development we just think that a better suited development could go here and if it doesn't then we'd like some of the steps taken to protect our business and our site in accordance with the bylaws thank you louise uh, very well researched the presentation council may have some questions any questions from the council do you have copies of the report that we you could share with us uh, I probably could email it. It's not a formal. That's fine. As long as you take it in the gist, it's not a formal legal document. I nope. could certainly email you if you have the. There's a lot there, and I, I would like to read it. Okay. No questions. Thank you very much. Any other presentations? Yes. Lorna Bell. I am a um, owner of property at 124 6th Elm North, which I operate as a rental property. So I'm a totally different perspective than Louise. I must say I'm blown away. I'm going to be skipping a lot of my notes because hers were so well researched that mine look rather dull now. Uh, I have a question to ask first, and has this project received reserve status yet, or is it still an urban holding? Has reserve? It's, an urban reserve. it's an urban holding. Okay. So you're well, it's an urban reserve. reserve. Urban reserve. Okay. All the documentation um, is done. Okay. Uh, because I understand that when it is uh, designated a reserve uh, status, that the town loses all jurisdiction with this property. We have the way it works. We have a uh, service agreement. Yes. So that service agreement with Saptoa Cree Nation. Uh, it's fairly extensive, but basically they agree to follow all the National Building Code, to follow all our <coughs> bylaws. Uh, it's fairly extensive. I can give you a copy of it. It's okay, public yeah, I information. I appreciate that. Yeah. Now, my a question uh, pertinent to that, is there a separate municipal service agreement for each property which is purchased by SAP? Yes. yes. Okay. And if this C-Store venture fails to make it, is there a new service agreement for another person coming in from SAP that wants to do something there, kicks down the convenience store and builds anything he wants there? Does the town have any they would have, recourse? They would have to follow the, go through the same process they're going through right now. Okay, so it's not a forever mm -hmm. thing and they have to approach us again. Okay, I wasn't clear on that. I did a lot of interneting on it, but there was nothing there. Um, another question, do you have the hours of operation? Will it be a 24 hour? Will it be a 12 hour? Because that affects the amount of traffic, the amount of foot traffic. And when you've got a residence there, that is a big issue. 
on behalf of my parents. It would be similar like to Windsor Shell, like we have, we have no regulation on mm -hmm. And there's no license. Other than, other than Sundays, I guess. There would be no license to stay open for X number of hours over something else because then again I would ask if that were upheld by the reserve status. You know. I'm not sure what you mean. No, well, when they're, when you, <laughs> how can I put this? If, slot, if the town of Slaughter would pass a bylaw yep. that said uh, all businesses have to close at 8 o'clock at night, okay. then they would be obligated to file it, follow that. Okay, so they would have to follow that. They're not exempt from that no. because yet they can still be exempt from all tax, personal income tax that they pay their employees and everything, but they would have to follow that. <coughs> and, and the uh, uh, and did, uh, the federal Department of Indian Affairs mm -hmm. wants to see those agreements before they set okay. that aside as reserve status. And that was another one of my yeah. questions, you know, to make sure that all all town bylaws and whatnot will be adhered to. Okay. Good. Um, now, do you know if the building will be on a basement or on a slab? I don't know. No basement. Means we didn't have any, no basement. Okay. So we all watched the fill be deposited on the site and obviously there was no compaction or uh, density checks. And I think as everybody knows, that street is very prone to water problems. So that would be a concern of mine because it's the ex <laughs> frequent excavation on that street regarding the water. So I was hoping that that will all be done to code. That's what I was going for there. Um, to me too, uh, just like Louise, I said, I think to myself that that is too small of a lot to accommodate all these things. Um, you were talking about underground tanks, Louise. I was thinking above ground tanks, which would make it even really worse. So I don't imagine you're that far with seeing the plans or anything. Like, do you know whether it would be underground or underground? Well, they're underground tanks. Okay. It's on the Okay, so a little more. Um, I was concerned as well about the delivery vehicles, the tankers that have been blocking the street. Pepsi truck is pretty long. Um, just a congestion problem on the street and then we have to consider the safety aspect which is it's downtown it's Main Street there are other businesses there's residential and now we're adding chemicals and potential explosives to that area so I just would like everyone to be aware of that um, and then assessment how is my how is the assessment branch going to look at my property now with added, added traffic, with added noise, with everything, am I going to be able to sell it? The way the, assess, the assessment works, your, well, the assessment, assessment, your assessment's based on uh, sales of similar kinds of properties. Right. Yeah. I'm just wondering how that will affect my assessment. Of, you know. but anyways, I, I had many more things to say, but like I say, Louise, Say them. No, no. <laughs> that's just fast and figures. We'll just hold you up by doing that. But I'd like to thank council for the opportunity to come and speak, and just to remember that it's not only for right now that you're making this decision; it's for the future of Sun River. So I would ask you to give some thought. Thank, thank you. you very much. Any questions? To I think it's important for council to hear from people like yourselves. So we don't hear those things. We don't know what's happening. But we may not know all that's happening, and I know we appreciate your sharing with us. Clayton, do you want to say anything? I don't have a specific presentation. My intent purpose to be here with you or to answer any technical questions. If there's questions from the ladies that they want to answer for me, or, or I, I council that would have some questions. Question. Uh, I guess in, in the first uh, question that we had was that with the fumes and the exhaust and all the requirements as far as that was discussed with the six feet and all that where where is that like has that been looked at and is that a potential issue or yes or is that the really venting um actually the site plan it doesn't show where the vent piping is but where the tanks are on that drawing the vent piping isn't specifically an exhaust it's actually your your intake for the tanks just like your plumbing vents your stack in your house it's to get your into the tank when the fuel is going out of the tank yeah, I see. so it's not exactly trying to exhaust but it's a direct line that goes to the tank um, 
I can't speak for the vehicle traffic and that exhaust. That's Isn't there an operation of fumes, though, that will come out of that? Very <coughs> well, I don't know how much comes out of that, but the main purpose of it is obviously for the air going, going into the into the tank when they're when they're fueling or emptying the tank, I should say. Um, the six foot demand distance, like I say, it's not shown on there, but it's basically directly east of where the tanks are, just inside the property line. Can I see that? Where the vent or not? Sure. Yep. Any other questions? Clayton, Tom, to the area. Uh, not, not necessarily Clayton, just have a few comments to make. You know, I've pretty much staked my political career on being as pro-development as possible. I, I don't think there's been a variation that came to this table that I haven't voted for. And, you know, I, I take a pretty loose interpretation, but these are some pretty extreme variations, and I think we're, I can't see how this fits in there. And you know what? I want to make anything fit in this town because I like seeing new growth more than more than anybody. So I don't care who's building it. I want to see it happen, but this just I don't see how this can happen on this lot. Like it. It's pretty extreme, and uh, uh, Mrs. Watkins brought up lots of good points as far as traffic and curb issues and, and people. I'm not the best driver. I'll probably take a shortcut or two. So if it's there, people will take it. So I just can't see it. This almost goes against everything I stand for as far as develop a way, but you've got to do it in an, in an orderly fashion. So I, I would have a hard time voting in favor of, of the variations proposed here tonight. I'm similar to Council Delory. I like I've been around a while, but I've never seen variations to this extent. I mean, very a few feet here and there, but these are like 40 percent of things, which is uh, okay. I have problems with that. Me too. Any other comments? Um, I, I echo what a uh, fellow councilor was saying. It's like there's some pretty significant uh, variation requests here. Um, along with uh, again with Miss Watkins and I, I didn't catch your name. Um, some of the concerns that you brought forward, I had an extensive list when I looked at it and you guys just tripled the list that I had. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of unknowns in this uh, project and stuff like that, but uh, as Councilor Deloria said, I, I took a, a look-see at that property and my biggest concern is like a lot of that, there's, there's going to be traffic nightmare there. It's going to be confusion corner. Um, that lot is just not the right location for that type of business venture for of that size. If they had the entire more square footage, maybe, but I, I just don't see the square footage uh, requirements. Um, yet the drawing looks good, it fits on the property that's there, but it, I don't see it taking into consideration the entrances of the egress and the exits to the streets, putting a solid wall onto Main Street, which blocks um, and doesn't do anything for the uh, appeal of Main Street in my mind. Um, again, same thing, I, I see people backing into all kinds of things, so without a protective barrier to Mrs. Watkins uh, building and stuff like that, I can see building intrusions uh, constant. So um, <coughs> unless there's a remedy to a lot of these stuff, uh, I can't see myself supporting this uh, uh, variation, especially to this degree where they're 30%, 40%, like to such great extent that uh, um, when we're just talking one or two percent or a couple of feet, but we're, we're talking a significant amount here. And uh, we have bylaws in place for, for reasons. And right now we're being asked to uh, turn a blind eye to a significant number of these bylaws. So if we don't follow our bylaws, why are they there in place? I guess another issue that, that, that this is brought up in my mind is in, in the central commercial area where this is being built, if they were requiring these, these, uh, these variances, this would be a permitted application. Uh, building a, a, a fueling station is a permitted application. It's not even a conditional use. So we wouldn't even come to this table. They'd file their permits and build their building without, without any, us saying anything about it. So I guess in, in the downtown area, I imagine... I would probably want to see it being a uh, uh, refueling station being changed to a conditional use, no matter if you had a, a whole block. It, it's the, in this day and age with environmental concerns, and trust me, I'm no environmentalist, I'm no tree hugger, but, but uh, 
but you, you do you have second store second floor apartments it's just a different area than say over on the highway where where the co-op gas bar built they got all the space in the world it could be a permitted use out there they don't if they they can if they meet all the uh, the zoning requirements there's no need for it to come to this table but uh but I, I guess what I, where I'm going with this is probably we should look at changing our bylaw to uh, to having any fuel station, no matter no matter even if it does meet the the requirements of the bulk use table, ha having it be a conditional use. So that that's just a, another added perspective I'd want to add on that. Any other comments, Councillor White? So I'm assuming Mr. Mahalchik being here, he would take those thoughts back to his design team and see what they could come up with. <laughs> Take a shot. There you go. Any other comments? Any comments? Councilor Jacobson. Yeah, just echoing some of the concerns that have been noted you know, so far. Is that <coughs> there are some major changes, and, and there's definitely, uh, I'm not against the uh, development and also inviting Sapatoya to become, you know, you know, part of our community as far as providing business opportunities and so forth. But definitely, we have something there, and I think that. Hopefully, maybe they can go back, and if it, this is defeated, of course, but uh, to go back and, and look at it again, because I definitely would like to see some some changes that are, are there. Councilor Delorean. I just got one other elephant in the room I want to deal with. When we leave this tomorrow, there's things going to be said as far as who the, who the applicant is, that, that maybe they're not being treated fair, but you know what? We have an excellent working relationship with SAP. We, Club SAP has been excellent for the community. You know, there was none of the the bad things that people said were going to happen, at least to my knowledge, haven't. It's, it's a pretty, it's a respectable business establishment. And you know what? I have no problem with urban reserves. I have no problem with anything that, as far as that nature. So I think that needs to be addressed and put out there that we want to see development. And I fully encourage SAP to figure out a development that will fit on this smaller property. Anybody else at the hearing used to say anything? I mean, just again, questions because I have to be careful what I am not. I'm not the owner of this property, so I don't want to say too many things on their behalf. There's been a lot of great points brought up here, so it's a good conversation. So just here to, to offer any explanations or answers to some questions. And there's been a lot of questions, so I can answer as many as I can. And we might want to do uh, outside of this and emails or whatever, just to give the technical information on what inspections have been done with the geotechnical and events and, and uh, everything like that. Um, we have been working hard trying to get this puzzle piece to fit um, because Sabatwick has approached Petrocan obviously quite a while ago and the proposed layout that they had at the beginning was driving onto Main Street. So we've been trying to steer them in the direction that, that we could possibly make this work. Um, and the layout that you've seen is something that Petrocan has approved and said they can make fit on this site. Um, so just moving the building away from, from Lisa's property and not having people drive onto Main Street was the, the best alterations we could do. But after that, it is what it is and we're just trying to do our best to make it work both ways. <coughs> I guess one question for Clayton is, uh, with with the main access being to the south, is there intention of, of an access on the north to Main Street as far as a pedestrian access to the building? No. So that, I guess that would be another reason why we almost need to make sure our bylaws, if you're going to have a building on Main Street, it needs to have an access to Main Street. I don't know if our bylaw ha probably doesn't have anything or else it would. but. For some somebody can build a ba uh, building with its back facing Main Street, with no doors to Main Street, and basically making Main Street a back alley. So I think we, we definitely have some holes in our bylaw that we need to look at. Uh, Julie, if we can look at that. <coughs> the other portion, if I may say something, is that as soon as you uh, change and modify the one bylaw, then it was still triggering another set of requirements that uh, I think started out applying for four variances and I was up with <coughs> 20 potential conflicts in bylaws so to me it's kind of a snowball effect that if this gets rolling 
it's just going to keep getting bigger and in principle if you approve it at a certain point at what point do you stop stop it and say even though petrocan says it fits um, it doesn't mean that it fits the use the location the neighborhood the amenities the traffic the social issues or any other aspect of the site other than physically they're making it fit on a reduced quarter size lot. Any other <coughs> last ones? Councillor Sackle. I don't know, they just brought up so many so many good topics and being with so many variances, I know I'm just echoing it again, but uh, I don't know. I, I can't see how we could possibly pass all those variances. We'd be against all of our bylaws, like not all of them, but a, a large portion of them. And, and I agree with Councillor DeVore, if we don't have anything in our town bylaw that states that you can't, even if they didn't require any variances, I, I think that's strongly something we should look at in those main cores. Uh, you know, I've heard horror stories about digging up uh, beside where the current White's drug store is and still fumes underneath the ground. And, you know, and, and I don't know if that's anything that we want to push forward going, going, going into the future and another bad aesthetic piece is, is that no access onto Main Street. There's going to be a blank wall there. Unfortunately, <coughs> we know what happens to blank walls in Swan River and how to keep graffiti off of it. And I just, aesthetically, I think it's going to make our Main Street uh, really in tough shape. Thank you. Last call for anybody. Clayton. I'm just going to say, I think everything happens for a reason here. Councilor already said, if they would have picked 1,200 square feet, we wouldn't be having this meeting. It'd be, we'd be building and rebuild. Um, so it's maybe a good opportunity to take a look at a lot of the variances and the bylaws to make this a little more simple um, process to go through these and possibly outline a lot of this uh, before we get to this point, I guess. So I don't envy Buddy any uh, decisions here but my point is you're right it could have been uh, being built without notifying us without completing the unfinished business without following rules even though they're supposed to and the precedents have been set the town had to finish their removing the brick already it's already been established that they aren't following the rules or are leaving things unfinished and even if they get a yes from one avenue not finishing their leftovers and that is a huge concern to me if they're not going to follow protocol at all as an owner regardless of who the owner is okay. thank you last call if there is no other presentations and I uh, adjourn the hearing so I'll call the resolution we have the resolution moved by Councilor Delorier seconded by Councilor Morial <coughs> Variation Order Application 2 2018 to allow the development of a C-Store gas bar on a lot size 1,900 square feet in lieu of 1,500 square feet to allow a side yard setback of 6 feet in lieu of 20 feet to allow the proposed development on a lot with 70 foot frontage in lieu of 150 to allow the proposed development to have a 1,620 square foot C-Store in lieu of 1,200 square foot on the property located at Parcel A, Plan 61789. 798303 Main Street be approved. And further be it resolved, this uh, approval is subject to the approval of all other required permits. Discussion? Recorded vote, please. Okay. All in favor? Opposed? Defeated. You're, you're in favor? No. The resolution is defeated. <laughs> But they don't give me information, and I don't know how to communicate by text with them. But so, if it's something that doesn't require any variations, then it just goes through. As soon as it requires a very variation, that's okay. right here. Except for which I've given you informal writing, which will maybe get answered at a later date of the unfinished foundation removal. I 
I'm asking for a timeline <coughs> when we plan to remove that. Can Derek get back to her on yeah. that? Yes, yeah. I will definitely contact you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just writing it down. It's basically between Saptor and Council. It's, it's coming right up stay. so you can stay yeah, for yeah, the 10 minutes. minutes. Be here. Yeah. I'll move I'll move so this is way too much to write down, so I'm hoping that there'll be some <coughs> something that we can use. Okay. I'll move it up on the agenda. So there, there, All there, this there, will, there, will yeah. be on YouTube if you want me to re-watch any of this as well. The motion moved by Councilor Memorial, second by Councilor Delorey, whereas Section 7-8 of the Zoning Bylaw requires any owner to remove a foundation wall from a building within 15 feet of a public building. Section 7-8 of the Zoning Bylaw requires any owner to remove a foundation wall from a building within 15 feet of a public building. Section 7-8 of the Zoning Bylaw requires any owner to after the building is removed and when a Saptoway Cree Nation has agreed to remedy the demolition deficiencies prior to any further construction or develop, as stated in the letter of January 17, 2017, and whereas removing the east wall may pose serious hazards to the neighboring building and surrounding areas, therefore be it resolved that Saptoway Cree Nation remove the remaining north and west basement walls prior to any development on 703 Main Street. Further be it resolved that all building permits of the said property be withheld until this work is completed to the town's satisfaction. Discussion, Councilor Gloria. In your decision paper, Derek, on the east uh, basement wall, the one that uh, Mrs. Watkins spoke of, uh, you, you have here that it should remain in its entirety. And now she is saying that it should be brought below grade. Right. So, so uh, have you have, have you talked? Had you talked to them previously about their thoughts on? Well, during the during the demolition, they had, they had indicated that they did they they didn't want to move. Mm -hmm. Now, now they you know I've heard tonight that they want to write a grade, and that's maybe that's a possibility. I don't know how hard that is. Regardless, even if we do decide to do that, I would still recommend to Sapatoya to have a structural engineer firm assess the integrity of that building, even if we lower that foundation on Sap side to grade. I don't I, like I just can't I can't sit here and say. Nope, it's not going to fall. So over. SAP is it. responsible for structural integrity of their foundation, is what you're saying? Well, the the foundation is is on the property line, and I can't say that there isn't any. I can't say that there isn't any load in there. I can't say that there is either. I I don't know what loading is on that foundation on the neighboring bu building or not. <clears throat> so you're, who who are you uh, referring to that needs to do this engineering study? Sapatoyak or Sapatoyak or ideally both of them. <clears throat> okay, any other discussion? All in favor? Well, um, well, in light of what we just had, uh, we need to make an amendment. We, we, yeah, I think we, should, we need to make an amendment regarding the east wall, at, at least to, to have. Uh, who, like, who's responsible for it? It's their wall. <coughs> Really, SAP pulls all their stuff out, and right. and it was. So, as Louis said, there's been nothing on this wall in two years. Uh, this, regardless of what happened with the variation on the development, this was outstanding, and this is finally, finally, we're going to decide on what's going to happen here. So this has obviously implications on the development of that lot, but uh, on how to f how to fix that east wall. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's our decision to say that they can, like what, what happens if we decide, yeah, okay, you can remove it, like Sapatoyak's gonna have, and that's fine. We can say, remove the foundation absolutely completely or you will not receive a, a building permit. Sapatoyak's gonna have to do what they need to do and it, you know, at whatever cost to make sure that their neighbor's building doesn't fall down or do they have any responsibility at all? Can they say, I'm taking out at my property line, and that's what I'm doing. If your building falls over, that's not my problem. I don't know what happens. Can we amend the 
um, resolution that there has to be a written agreement between both parties regarding that east wall before we proceed with any permit? Councilor Sapp. I don't know if we can do that. What if the one party never wants to agree just because they don't like the idea of having them as a property beside them so they could, True. we put that in there, the person could just say no, no, every time. Did you speak? Do you have anything to add on that? Or, or no, no, it's okay if you don't. This is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> What's the next one? Um, the east property, that one's a tricky one, but that's that's the catch is the responsibility of it. And you, it will be some legal advice on it, but I don't think you're going to be able to get something in writing on both parties. One is going to have to be in favor. Um, because if you take that foundation wall down, there's a deep basement and there's a shallow foundation. Chances are you take that deep foundation wall out, it's, it, it's not going to be, be pretty. They, they wouldn't have backfilled properly underneath there with that. It's a kind of a crawl space underneath. I don't, I don't really know the condition of that, but I just do know, I do know that it's a shallow foundation and a deep foundation. If you take the deep foundation away, well, away there will be undermining, but uh, I don't know how to, it's not a cut and dry thing. I honestly don't know how that would play out. Like, as a property owner, does SAP have any response? I mean, if they wanted to make that into a, a natural park and pull all, everything man-made out of there, as a property owner, isn't it within their right to do that? On and their own property. On their own property? And Watkins is basically at their mercy, at their mercy which I'd hate, yeah, I'd hate to be Watkins, but I mean, property rights are property rights. So I, how, how, do you tell, <coughs> how do you tell staff that they can't pull that out if they want to? I'm sure they actually probably want, want to leave it there. But. If an engineer can go in there and look and make sure that the two foundations, there's no steel connecting them, the concrete has it attached to, to, in their professional opinion, say that pulling that over will not pull anything with it, then maybe they can do that, but again, that's... Or you even something. get an engineer to recommend on getting it below grade. Can we just add to our resolution that, that the town be provided with a with the new engineer's recommendation from SAP on, on proper removal of, of the uh, proper remediation of the... Resolution. East wall, I don't know. Or you send it to the lawyer. Yeah, I we can we're in the I guess we are in the we're in the driver's seat. We we won't allow development until we see well whatever you guys feel is acceptable, whether it's gone or not gone. What does Ron think? Ron thinks the he believes that it's their property, they do as they wish. But in, in a, I just don't know. I don't know what, how that works. If I if I do something to my property that causes undue hardship to my neighbor directly, as in building falls over, is there any liability there? I I don't know. The lawyer will say you should have known. Maybe speak to the attorney. Sit here and shut up. <laughs> But do you know what I mean? There's, there's. But she's also indicating that them, what they've removed so far, potentially could have damaged their, their existing foundation on their side um, by the banging and the removing because they're side by side. Right. She says that Sabatoy says they didn't. Mm -hmm. That's all you're saying to right. you know. mm -hmm. Okay. Where are we going here, folks? Um, did I move that? Yes. Um, and Deloria second. Yeah, I'm right now on an amendment. Uh, therefore, be resolved to have to provide an engineer's uh, uh, recommendation. Assessment? I'd like an actual recommendation on it. Yeah. Um, on what's to be done with the, the East Wall. On remediation of the East Wall. Should it be solely Sapatoyaks? Well, the property owners, they, they they probably should have a prime interest of that in that wall, I would think. It doesn't affect them once they remove it. But I mean an engineer is going to he has his own liability to to worry about what he's gonna do 
whatever he needs to do to protect his liability. So that's why the engineer's not going to make another building fall over, I wouldn't think. If I'm taking a wall down on my property and Clayton's wall happens to fall over, it's not my fault. I'm still on my property. But in a court of law, can your neighbor say, you knew it was going to fall over. You've caused me undue hardship by doing your work. Like, you knew it was going to They don't know without an engineer. That's true. But I is it not? There's a, yeah, it's, I can, I can So they're waiting for their building permits with this, eh? Because we won't give them. We're not signing anything until this is resolved. So regardless, like I say, regardless of what happened with the variation, it wasn't moving until this is solved. Bring the amendment forward, Jason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, therefore, be it resolved, so that we provide an engineer's recommendation on removal of the east wall, on removal or modification, or modification. They can, if they can lower it, lower it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Modification of the east wall. Removal or modification below grade. And said, and said re recommendation be binding upon uh, Saptuayak to complete the work. Be it resolved. So, be th therefore, be it resolved, Saptoway provide an engineer's recommendation so on. Further, so, you have to have another one. So, therefore, be resolved, and then further be resolved. Yeah. So two further be resolved. We have the motion moved by Councilor Morio, second by Councilor Delory, whereas Section 7.8 of the Zoning Bylaw requires any owner to remove the foundation after the building is removed, and whereas the Saptaway Cree Nation has agreed to remedy the demolition deficiencies prior to any further construction or development, as stated in a letter on January 17, 2017, and whereas removing the east wall may pose serious hazards to the neighboring building and surrounding areas, therefore further be it resolved, Saptaway Cree Nation provides the first therefore has to be there. Therefore, be it resolved, Saptaway Cree Nation remove the only remaining north and west basement walls prior to any development on 703 Main Street. And be it further resolved that Saptaway Cree Nation provide engineering recommendation on removal or modification, or modification of the east or distance of borders. Yeah, east wall. East wall. And said recommendation uh, be binding upon SAP and to carry out, SAP to a Cree Nation to carry out. And, last and then there's the last for the Further be it resolved that all building permits on the said property will be withheld until this work is completed to the town satisfaction. Discussion? Hey. Councilor SAP. I'm not sure I can move in favor of that one. I just don't know if it's their responsibility to get an engineer to, to, to say that that wall. They're they're in charge of their lot, and I it, it's over my head as far as like I I don't know if we can pass it along or find get better clarification, but I don't know if we can impose I don't know if it's their responsibility. That's that's my own thoughts. 
Councilor Moore and then Councilor Jacobs. Um, just in, when you're reading out the bylaw and the first therefore be resolved, the word only needs to be striked out. Where is that? Uh, it says Sabatoya Cree Nation would remove only the remaining north and west wall. So because we're making an amendment to the east, so the word only needs to be scratched out. I kind of agree with Councillor Sacco that I just don't know if that we can do something like that and maybe this should be looked at being tabled but maybe we should look at some other advice or if it's legal advice on the matter. But we absolutely can because part of the, the original agreement that they agreed to was that they would remove the basement. So they've, al they've already agreed to it and entered into an agreement saying they would. Councillor Sacco. So we stick to that agreement, they can remove the basement and not worry about the neighbor's property. True. Yeah, I guess they've already agreed to move the, remove the east wall. So any further discussion? All in favor of the resolution? Polls. It's carried. It's a Not legal, they'll tell us. It's been so long I lost my. Back up to 5 1. Back up to 5 1. Main street tree request from uh, Key Shell to put a planter there instead of the tree. Councilor Deloria. I guess um, if we. Um, allow this to be a planter, we will have requests from half the business of Main Street to get rid of trees. And I mean, part of me says it's their Main Street. If that's how they want it to look, then, then that, maybe that's how it should. The other part of me says that at some point there was a decision made 20 years ago that the, the community got behind having a tree Main Street and they're, they're just going to be starting to develop nicely now. Um, because we, we've had other requests to get rid of the trees. So, like I said before, I'm no tree hugger, but I mean, that's that's what we're asking for by allowing this. And, and in the decision paper, you say that we have uh, no written agreement. We do have a written agreement, and that's the fact that in the variant, in, in the resolution, that was one of the conditions. So that that's all the agreement we need. We were allowed to put conditions on that, uh, on that property. That was one of the conditions. There's no more agreement needed than that. That's true, yeah. That is true, yeah, the yeah. resolution did state that. Councilor Morin. Um, again, I, I, we made an agreement with the variation that uh, for them to cut down that tree, they had to put another one on the block somewhere. Um, again, years ago, there was a decision again, like I said, to put trees on Main Street. The trees were there before um, that business decided to remodel their building um, for it there. So the tree was there first. So. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, they need to uphold their uh, agreement to replant another tree. Uh, I understand, yeah, it may look a little odd and stuff like that, but uh, um, they took one down tree and the agreement was to put one back up. So that was part of the variance that they requested and that was the condition. So they need to uphold it. So, Councillor Delorier. So, again, in your decision paper, you're talking about the line of sight from the back lane. And I'm trying to picture it right now but it is can they not move just move it further uh, east that's where it will go if, it, if you decide that they have to put up a tree it'll, it'll go, go further further east. further east because there's nothing further east right now between there's three trees there already so there'll be four trees from the back lane to eight and how many if you go west of the back lane but and west of where their the cutout is or whatever they call it there's well there's one now because the other one got taken away. yeah and they don't want to go west uh, there's a street lamp there, which would, you could go west, but it would put it within, well, it's going to be within six feet of the other tree the other way, so they'll have two trees directly in a row to the west or the east. You know, part, part of me says, this is foolish, it's a, it's a stupid tree. Not that trees are stupid, we need, because trees are near and dear to our community, don't get me wrong. But I mean, it's one tree, and this is an economic opportunity, but, and I guess, I'm not necessarily opposed to it as long as we know what we're asking for. How, how, how can we tell the few the other people that have asked for their trees to be pulled out that they can't now? Any other discussion? 
We have the motion with Councilor Moore. Their, their remedy was for the, like a flower pot and stuff like that. Like, who would be looking at the cost of replanting that flowers and on an annual basis? They would provide the pot, the flowers, and the maintenance to it. Councilor Sample. So, just trying to, I might have missed it. Which side of the uh, back lane are they proposing to put the tree now? Well, the, they don't want a tree at all. So, I'm saying if we are going to put a tree, it's going to be east of the very last picture. You see a tree sitting there on quite a ways east of the back lane. It's going to be where I'm standing. Why, why couldn't they put it? It's still not going to block their sign if they put it still on the west side. No? Like why would we, we move it all the way this way? We can't do that, but if people coming out of this back lane wanting to turn east, okay. we are going to receive complaints. We how, already see complaints far, on this How street. far is this one from this? That is probably 12 feet. That's 12 feet from the back lane to there? Probably, maybe 10 to 12 feet. The old placement was 12 feet. Did they want to get rid of it? Uh, the old placement was 12 feet. So there's quite a bit so the of noise. They don't want it to replace it. But they, were told they, they, have to. they don't want it, obviously, any. If it has to we go can't here, cut the trees down, it's, like it's the from. only place it can go is here, which is right next to the other building. We already receive places. complaints from this so tree. The, uh, I think the accommodation is a plan a little Okay, further. any other discussion? Councilor Sackman. I just back and forth on this. I don't want to overcrowd their lot on the, I guess, west side. If it was me, it should go on that east side, but then there's going to be traffic complaints again. I don't know if it was fine where it was. <laughs> I don't know where we're going. I'll call the question. We have the motion moved by Councilor Delore, second by Councilor Jacobson, resolved that the key shell holes place a decorative permanent planter in place of the fallen tree on the sidewalk along Main Street. Discussion. All in favor. Opposed. Place the planter. Place the planter. Opposed. Okay. Phil. I don't. I just don't understand. Who said they had to put a tree? We in? did. When, when? when they applied for their permit, they wanted to pull it out. We made that a condition of their but permit. They put a tree back. Yes. No. Not in that location, but somewhere in this. Okay, you have a letter from the Urban Forest Committee for your information. Are we do, are, is there any process involved when people cut trees down on town property without permission? What's the vandalism we should be yeah, following? Are we doing anything about it? Usually, well, it, had, it did just happen. Uh, usually they ask, they think this is pretty rare. So what will the follow-up be now that we are aware? That's up to you. Do you want to create a bylaw that finds these people? Or well, do I don't think we need a bylaw. Sheet? There's already a law that you can't vandalize property. You say you need okay, so when we find out, we will go to the RCMP and go after that. The road we want to take. I well, I'm going to think something happens. Because it, it's just a direct principle. But it'll be cutting all the trees down they don't like. Yeah, like it's counterintuitive. We, we're planting trees on boulevards to get them there. Um, and just because I don't like that tree after, for whatever reason, I get to cut it down. It's not your tree to cut down. Exactly. So, so just right. let the RCMP know that vandalism has occurred. So we will go ahead with charges for anyone who cuts down a tree on our property. Certainly. Um, okay, the next one is uh, just information on the 24th, I think. I don't have it up here on the bench. Rex Leach, Rex, Leach, Rex Leach Trail uh, opening ceremonies down at the museum. <laughs> Superintendent Works Report. You missed the first two, the whatever the G proposed to the EMS. <laughs> no, we didn't. Okay. You know, I, I hate to do this, but I gotta, we got to go back to the Urban Forest one, please. Night. Okay. Thank you. Because I, I, I've always taken a bit of an issue. We just randomly plant trees in front of people's houses, whether they want them or not. No, nope. we ask. Oh, well, we always ask? We've asked the past okay, four well, years. Yeah. The past four years? Okay. Okay. Well, then that's a different story. Okay. Like, there's a process. If, if the tree is in the way, if they come to, for permission and stuff like that, there's a process to remove the tree. Come and ask. Come and ask. And if you provide a legitimate reason, the 
tree can be removed. We have done that. But just to go with your own chainsaw and cut it down, that's vandalism. Thank you. No different than spraying the building. Okay, back, I'll try and get back on track. Okay, we have the letter from the General Contractors Alliance of Canada uh, for information about legislation. Council wish to respond to that. Okay, the next one is the Association of Manitoba Municipalities request for a visit. I think we accept that. But that's time. We've got something ready for you. Okay, the Superintendent Works Report. Questions to Derek. Well, a couple, of Derek, uh, the good news about the, the wells pumping and feeding our community. Uh, yep, yeah, there's. We're just waiting for the, we're still waiting for the drill rig to come on site to install the pump in well number two and to inspect well number three. That's been quite a while. It has been quite a while. Uh, <clears throat> they, they, they're trying, they're on, other, they're on other sites and we're just trying to get them back. Do they have a timeline they're, they're offering? I do not have one right now. Any anything back from the CNR relative to the plug culvert south of town over here? I have nothing from CNR. Okay. Come through. Yes, yeah. Jacobs. Uh, Derek, um, plans for some uh, back alley repair work on the third block of Sixth and Seventh Avenue South. Um, just wondering, you have something planned there? This year, and is that going to be done to deal with some drainage issues? Yes, we're lowering the back lane in the center section of that back lane, and yes, we fully intend on getting that done this summer, as promised. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Councilor Moore? Um, how are we doing with the, I guess, garbage truck for the Lions? Is the backup truck is that fixed and operational? Well, that's been solved, or uh, no, I. You know what, I, I, I can get a report to council on that. I don't know what the status of the truck is. I know that it's still in our shop. <clears throat> Any other questions? Councilor Freeze. Um, is Mike arranging to have the uh, floor pulled into the garage anytime soon? Or do you know? Sure. It'll, talk to you. It'll be the Monday of the parade week. Okay. Yeah. I should let him know what I'm on it. As far as he knows, it's the swan. That's all he needs to Okay, the motion uh, moved by Councilor Deloria, second by Councilor Morial, was all the superintendent works report they received. All in favor? Carried. The motion moved by Councilor Jacobson, second by Councilor Deloria, was all the handy van report for June 2018 being received. Discussion? All in favor? Carried. Okay, you have the management minutes. Any questions to Julie or Derek on those minutes? If not, we'll go to reports. Councilor Morial. Um, this period, I didn't have any meetings and stuff like that, but in the meantime, I've been uh, reading uh, two lengthy reports that were commissioned uh, by the province. Uh, the first one, the, the Peachy report, and the second one on the Manitoba Wait Times Task Force report. They're both lengthy uh, reports as to the direction of healthcare in Manitoba and what it means for our community. So um, I highly recommend that in your leisure, um, if you guys want to read that re those two reports, it's very well worthwhile reading and it's very informative as to what some of the possibilities and support in the evidence and the data that we've been looking for for some of our projects moving forward is already self-contained in those uh, reports. I encourage everybody to read <coughs> the reports. Council Lorraine. Nothing to report at this time. Council Jake. Well, I was on holidays a little bit myself, but uh, since I've been back, I obviously had an opportunity to uh, be uh, attending the Saptoya Creation groundbreaking 
uh, event there last week, and it was very interesting to be a part of, and the uh, ceremony that they had within the, their teepee there. So uh, hopefully, uh, even though that something is going to be eventually built there, that they can come up with a solution to some of the issues that were discussed tonight. Um, just a few other questions that I actually I missed one with Derek actually earlier, and that was to do with in our soccer pitches and uh, area, the role and the access during the summer months. Do we actually block that access at all, or do we just leave it open for the whole summer and, and just block it in the winter time? Only winter. Only in the winter time. Yeah. Okay. Other than that, uh, that's it. Councilor White. Just a couple. Uh, the Urban Forest and uh, Communities in Bloom uh, met collaboratively to look at uh, ways to make our community prosper and more beautiful. And it was nice to see the cooperation with the two entities and we have some plans on how to do that. Uh, working together is always the best way. And the uh, TLE, uh, the Historic Project, uh, I attended also uh, the pipe ceremony, which was really remarkable, especially the history around that one. I appreciate that. <coughs> I look forward to working with the group. Thank you. Councilor Friesen. I also was at the Moon and Urban Forest meeting, and uh, we uh, are having the judges come on next Wednesday, which brings me to any of you want to meet the judges. We're having lunch down at the uh, Major Park because that's the senior slope edge tournament, so we thought a perfect place to gather if any of you would like to come down and meet them. Um, also that evening, I'm taking them to the uh, Ag Society's uh, exhibi uh, Exhibitors and Sponsorship Supper. Um, on the 21st of July, if you go by the Swan at night, it's going to be red. Just giving you an FYI. Um, apparently we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Special Olympics, and their token color is red, and they would like to make the swan red that night, so they're going to put some red over the lights so that the swan appears red. Um, the float, who would be around on uh, parade day? Don't everybody jump at once. If you'd like to let me know, well, oh, are you doing one? Okay, let me know. Bahamut. Bahamut, yeah. Um, congrats to Atkinson Sports Excellence for 40 years. We had a barbecue on Thursday and all proceeds went to Special Olympics. Thank you to Super 8 for putting up our judges when they come next uh, Tuesday night. And the soccer pitch roads are open in the summer because we take our judges down to see the soccer pitches. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, and I just would like to um, encourage all the businesses on Main Street or wherever, if they happen to have weeds in front of their store, please pull them. That's your responsibility to make them look good. There's a few that have... Trees? No, trees are good. Oh, there's some wild trees growing too. Is there? Well, I know a place that's got weeds that are well up to my waist, and I'm not saying who it is, but if you know who you are, get out there and pull them. That's all. Thanks. Councilor Sackle. Not too much to report. Uh, congratulate to Atkinson's too. I attended that event. It was actually uh, kind of nice. I know Ray and Ross or maybe Phil put it together, but a book of kind of the the history of the store and some earlier pictures and it was very interesting to see yes, right. some of the earlier uh, events on a business that's been there 40 years and congratulate to Councillor Friesen on her 70th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, took 70 years to make me look this good. What are you asking? Thank you. We have the motion moved by Councillor Jacobson, <laughs> Secretary <laughs> of the Lord. Right. Resolve Councils follow. The hereby approved for payment general accounts from check 22710 to 22800 for a total of 301,267.31. Payroll account from check 4262 to 4266 for a total of 13,504.23. And payroll accounts from check 4267 to 4275 for a total of 107,541.64. Questions? Councilor Morian. 
Um, for check number 22749 for $500 to the City of Flint Flon for scuba mask and cylinder. Um, I thought we just bought 15 scuba masks and cylinders. Why are we... Those were ones that Brendan and Brett bought to participate in the fit testing. And um, the town bought them for them um, because it has to be bought through a municipality. But they are going to be paying the town back fully for those. For fit testing. For that competition they oh, went the to. Oh, the fire um, fit. Yeah, okay. fire fit, yeah. Okay, so this... Sorry, fit so, testing. So that $500 is being reimbursed? Yes, yes. Okay. It'll be reimbursed back to the town in full. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor of the resolution? It's carried. And you forgot Julie's report. Okay, we'll go back. <coughs> Julie's report. That's okay, I was just going to say I don't have anything other than my normal work duties, just dealing with stuff in the office uh, to report, so okay. nothing, uh, nothing We have the motion <laughs> moved by <laughs> Councillor White, seconded by Councillor Friesen, where it was the letter of resignation attached as Schedule A be received. Discussion? All in favor? Carried. Motion moved by Councilor White, second by Councilor Friesen. We'll resolve the following building permit applications be received. Uh, El Trevelyan fence and gates, $5,750. Very Alfred fence, $1,600. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. The motion moved by Councilor White, second by Councilor Friesen. Whereas resolution number 2018.340 reads, resolve the town purchase a half ton truck from Key Chevrolet in the amount of 27777 but such a truck was not included in the 2018 capital budget. And whereas section 169.7 of the Municipal Act states no public notice or public hearing is required for an expenditure funded by a transfer from a specific purpose purpose reserve unless the expenditure is for a purpose other than that which the reserve fund was established. And whereas the truck will be added to the town fleet and the truck from the town fleet will be rented to the Swan Valley Employment and Training Project Work Group Program, be it hereby resolved that the truck purchase be funded by transfer from the mach machinery reserve and replacement fund to the general operating fund and be it further resolved that rental payments Swan Valley Employment and Training Project be transferred to the machinery replacement reserve fund upon receipt. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. The motion moved by Councillor White, second by Councillor Friesen. Resolved that Stephanie Martin be hired as a full time office clerk effective July 24, 2018. Discussion? Councillor Moore. Um, Unlikeness who this person is. Pardon? Who is this person? Um, she lives near Bozeman, and she grew up here, and her husband moved back here. I'm but not sure the exact year, but... So she, she's met all her credentials and mm -hmm. reference, multiple reference mm -hmm. checks have been all satisfactory and all that stuff? Yes. Okay. Do you think she'll be a good fit? I do. Okay. All in favor? Motion moved by Councillor White, second by Councillor Fries, and resolve that pursuant to section 152.3 of the municipal act, council go into committee and close the meeting for the public. All in favor? 